Welcome to this uh, lecture series on eukaryotic gene expression basics and benefits. Today we are going to discuss about a very interesting topic called transgenic animals. This is the lecture number 35 in this series. <coughs> the last 4 or 5 lectures we have primarily been discussing about various eukaryotic expression systems. We discuss about the use of viral vectors and non-viral vectors for expressing genes in mammalian cells in culture and then we went about and discussed about how these non-viral and viral vector systems can be used for expressing genes in humans, a field called as human gene therapy, <coughs> how it took off, what are the problems and prospects, this were discussed in detail. <coughs> and in the last class we discussed about another very interesting area of uh, research called DNA vaccines and how a very simple gene delivery and gene expression technique namely injection of just a naked DNA plasma into skeletal muscle or skin leading to very inefficient gene expression, but although did not fail as a gene therapy technique, but found a new application in the form of evoking an immune response against for a foreign antigen and how this very simple and versatile technique led to the development of a whole new field of research called DNA vaccines and how by the at least two products are right now in the market based on this DNA vaccine technology. <coughs> Today we are going to discuss about another very, very interesting um, area of research called transgenic animals. <coughs> the, may, the main distinction between this lecture and the lectures I have listed above here from 31 to 34 is that in all the previous lectures we focused our attention primarily on introducing genes into somatic cells of the body and especially when we are discussing about human, human gene therapy, I told you that so far all the gene therapy experiments are basically confined to only somatic cells, there is no germline gene therapy. <coughs> But today we are going to discuss about introducing genes into germline of animals and how transgenic animals can be generated by integration of insertion and integration of foreign genes into the genome of animals and their transmission to the progeny. This is the most important. So far all the gene transfer techniques we have discussed <coughs> in re with reference to the DNA vaccines or human gene therapy, they are all performed only in the somatic tissues of the um, um, body. But for the first time we are going to discuss about introducing genes into the germline. But this transgenic technology is primarily confined to only <coughs> the non-human animals, namely the uh, mammals which are not humans. No germline uh, um, gene insertion or expression is permitted in, in humans till now and we will primarily now discuss about how genes are being inserted into animals such as mice, domestic animals and so on and so forth either for the purpose of understanding the function of genes or understanding the function of the regulatory sequences or for the benefit of mankind for expressing certain proteins which are of economic importance which are very useful to man and so on and so forth. So what is transgenic technology? <coughs> transgenic technology <coughs> as I said in the previous slide is the introduction of genes into the germline of animals or integration of these genes into the chromosome of the animal so that not only the gene is introduced and expressed in the animal in which you have introduced, but this gene is carried through the successive generations as well. So the offspring generated by the uh, animal, transgenic animal also contains a transgene. So this transgene is carried through from one generation to another. This transgenic technology is very important because it led to the development of number of domestic animals <coughs> and fish, birds, etc. with an altered genetic profile that enabled them to either grow faster. These are all very useful traits to have. For example, if you have fish which can grow faster than a normal fish, that means you, you do not have to grow them for much longer time. You can cut down your culture costs. So by introducing growth hormone gene into fish for example, you can make this fish grow much faster. So you do not have to keep them uh, in the aquaria for too long. Mm. Similarly, you can generate pigs with reduced waste or you can generate cows which are prion free. <coughs> which are resistant to some of the mad cow disease or the bovine spongiform encephaly and so on and so forth. So basically by introducing appropriate genes into the animals or birds or fish, you can get the desired characteristic. So that those transgenic animals have a very useful trait that has <coughs> benefit that is beneficial to the human, to them as well as to the humans. So thanks to the transgenic technology. Today we have mouse models for several types of cancer and human genetic disorders including chronic hepatitis, sickle cell disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's and so on and so forth. So not only we are trying to express genes into animals with the purpose of making a protein, 
that may have a economic importance or that may be useful to the humans. But by using, by expressing certain genes or certain proteins into these animal models, we are also able to generate animal models that are more appropriate for certain diseases. Because many, many a times we are not able to test a drug or we are not able to develop a vaccine for a particular disease mainly because we do not have appropriate animal models. So, unless you have a right animal model and unless you test these drugs or vaccines in these appropriate animal models, you cannot go and test your drugs or vaccines into humans. So, some of the major problems in certain major diseases is to have lack of appropriate animal models. So, by using transgenic technology, you can actually introduce the right kind of genes into these animals like mice or other animals and create better models for understanding the disease or for testing drugs and vaccines and so on and so forth. So, transgenic technology is useful not only for expressing proteins of economic importance, but they also can be used for developing animal models for a number of diseases. The credit for developing the transgenic technology goes to two people. I have given the pictures here, <coughs> Ralph Binster in University of Pennsylvania, United States and Richard Palmiter, University of Washington in United States. So, these are the two people who developed the transgenic, transgenic mice technology or the transgenic technology and are the first to create a transgenic mice, first to create a transgenic mouse. So, by definition a transgenic animal should have one or more foreign genes into the chromosomes, so that not only the gene is carried by the organism, but also by its future generations. So, let us see what exactly Brinster and Palmiter did, how did they done, de develop this transgenic mice. The landmark paper or the landmark research that happened in the area of transgenic technology was the paper which appeared in the year 1982. This paper appeared in <coughs> I think in um, Nature <coughs> 1982 and what basically this paper actually drew the attention of researchers all across the globe primarily because this was the first time a mouse was created by introducing a foreign gene into the mouse and the introduction of this foreign gene into this mouse led to development of a very, very stunning phenotype. For example, I am showing a picture here, which actually appeared in the cover page of nature of this particular issue in the 1982, where you can see the one on the left, which is much bigger, it is a transgenic mouse and the other one is a normal uh, litter mate of the uh, born to the same uh, mother. And this mouse actually carries a transgene expressing rat growth hormone. So, when you express rat growth hormone, these mice grew much bigger than the normal litter mates. So, for the first time, Ralph and Brinster and Palmiter actually showed that by expressing a growth hormone gene in a mice and by generating transgenic mice, mouse, you can alter the phenotype of the mouse. And not only that, this phenotypic trait can be passed down from one generation to another generation. <coughs> so, a team led by Richard Palmiter and Rand Wilster made a construct in which the rat growth hormone gene was placed under the control of a zinc inducible methanothionine promoter. In our previous classes, we had discussed how uh, we have discussed a number of examples of constitutive promoters, inducible promoters and so on and so forth and how people are using both constitutive as well as inducible promoters for expressing genes in mammalian cells. So, what Brinston and Palmiter did is they actually used an inducible promoter called a methanothionine promoter and this promoter can be induced by adding metals like cadmium, zinc and so on and so forth. So, in the absence of these metals, the expression of metallothionine is very, very low, but when you now in the presence of these metals, metallothionine promoter is turned on. So, they took the rat growth hormone gene and placed it under the control of a metallothionine promoter and this entire construct was actually introduced into fertilized mouse embryos and, the, <coughs> and these mouse embryos which were into which this transgene construct was introduced was then put into a foster mother. We will discuss how exactly the transgenic mice are made in a couple of minutes, but just for the time being be aware that this transgenic construct, construct which contains the growth hormone gene under the control of a metallothionine promoter was introduced into the fertilized mouse oocyte or mouse embryos and this the offspring which are formed from these embryos when they were fed with zinc they turned on the metallothionine promoter and therefore, the growth hormone was expressed and this resulted in high levels of circulating growth hormone and dramatically changed the phenotype of the transgenic mice by stimulating to, to grow twice as large as the normal. That is what is the picture shown here. So, by introducing a transgene under the control of a metallothionine promoter 
into the germline of mice and by feeding these mice with zinc they demonstrated that this metrothenin promoter can be turned on by the zinc and it in turn turns off the human growth hormone gene and as a result high levels of human growth hormone is produced in the circulation and that result in the very uh, dramatic growth of these mice compared to the normals. So, this giant mice instilled major excitement in the scientific and public communities markedly enhancing the attention of the transgenic mouse system. So, the 1982 is a landmark in the area of transgenic technology because it demonstrated for the first time you can actually manipulate the germline of animals and you can introduce genes and express them and you can get a desired phenotype. <coughs> so, this is basically what they did. They took the um, uh, promoter region of the mouse metallothenin promoter and using restriction enzymes and the usual genetic manipulation techniques cloned the road, rat growth hormone gene downstream of the metallothenin promoter and proved the appropriate 3 prime regulatory sequences for polyadenylation and so on and so forth and introduced this construct into the germline of the mouse. <coughs> so, this is the landmark paper uh, published in the year 1992 in the journal Nature, which said dramatic growth of mice that developed from X micro injected with metallothenin growth hormone fusion genes by Brinster, Palmiter, and Ron Evans. <coughs> so, Ralph Brinster and Palmiter thus pioneered the development of methods to transfer foreign genes to the germline of animals, and a seminal experiment showed that new genes could be introduced into the mammalian genome. So, this is the first successful demonstration of introducing genes into the germline of mammals and expressing them leading to a very, very dramatic phenotype. This technology which was originally developed in transgenic mice was later extended to other domestic animals like cattle, goats and so on and so forth and th this led to the demonstration of the potential of this technology for the enhancement of growth. You can, you can make pigs grow bigger, you can make cattle give more milk and so on and so forth or you can modify resistance to a particular disease <coughs> or you can produce milk containing human proteins of medical importance and um, such as clotting factors and so on and so forth um, indicating that it became a very, very powerful technology. <coughs> so, by extending this transgenic technology which was originally developed in mice to other domestic animals, it became very clear that you can actually use these farm animals for making proteins of your of which are useful to you. So, so far we have been discussed about expressing proteins or putting genes into yeast cells or E. coli cells or mammalian cells and then making these cells, converting these cells into bioreactors for making proteins of our interest. But now we are discussing about introducing genes into the germline of farm animals and now the farm animals now become bioreactors. So, you have now cattle producing growth hormone, cattle producing medically important proteins like factor 8, factor 9 and so on and so forth. So, by using this transgenic technology, it became possible to convert animals into bioreactors. <coughs> so, the impact of transgenesis is emphasized by the huge number of research groups and corporations that utilize the transgenic technology to study important fields of embryonic as well as adult physiology. The transgenic technology also became an excellent tool in basic research for understanding the functions of a number of mammalian genes as well as their regulation. So, what I am going to do in the next few slides is to actually give you some very exciting examples of how transgenic technology was used and what exciting research was done and, and what was the exciting outcome that came out of this. So, the transgenic mice are usually generated to characterize the ability of a promoter to direct tissue specific expression or inducible expression. <coughs> For example, I will give an example of a tissue specific expression. For example, here is in a study that was published. Uh, <coughs> um, <coughs> by this group um, <coughs> where they have actually used the promoter region of a gene called neurogenin 1 which is actually expressed in very specific regions of the nervous system. And if you now put a beta galactosidase gene under the control of this neurogenin promoter and when you make a transgenic mice and when you look at the expression, when you now look for the beta galactosidase expression in this transgenic mice, wherever the neurogenin promoter is expressed in these embryos, in those regions you can detect beta galactosidase expression. And you can see here the beta galactosidase is expressed wherever the neurogenin promoter is active under this particular stage of embryonic development. So, the transgenic technology became a very useful tool for mapping or for identifying spatial and temporal expression of very, very important promoters. If you want to know for example, 
where is the Hox promoter or a homeo box promoter is expressed or when a particular homeotic gene is expressed or where are the homeotic gene is expressed, you can use this kind of an approach where you take the promoter region, put a reporter gene and make this kind of transgenic convergence and see what happens. <coughs> so, you can understand both the developmental regulation as well as similarly if you can put a tissue specific promoter and put a reporter gene and see the question whether this gene gets expressed only in that particular tissue. So, the transgenic technology became an excellent tool to understand tissue specific and developmental specific expression of genes by using reporter genes linked to their promoters. And you can also use, <coughs> so you can use a promoter, you can use the transgenic technology to understand the ability of a promoter to direct tissue specific expression. Like what I said, a promoter can be attached to a reporter gene such as LAXZ or GFP. The other important reason why people make transgenic mice is to examine the effects of overexpressing or misexpressing endogenous or foreign genes at specific times and locations in animals. For example, the study where I showed where you actually expressed human growth hormone under control of metallothionine promoter, what I actually showed that when you overexpress growth hormone, it results in a gigantic phenotype, it enhances the weight of the animal. <coughs> So, like that you can now see what you can ask the question, what happens if you express an oncogene? What happens if I over express a tumor suppressor gene? Or what happens if I express, <coughs> I mean a growth factor? You can ask any number of questions and see what happens when you express. Or suppose a gene is getting expressed only one, one particular tissue and you ask the question, what happens if I express the tissue another tissue of an animal? Will it have any dramatic effects? So, a huge number of questions could be asked using this transgenic technology. So, not only you can use this transgenic technology for understanding these functions of the promoters, where they are expressed and when they are expressed, you can also use to take transgenic technology to understand function of many of these genes, what these genes normally do. This is one example where I can, I showed you where by expressing a reporter gene under the control of a neurogen in promoter, you can exactly identify during development where exactly this promoter is turned on in animals. Similarly, here is another example where using another reporter gene called the green fluorescent protein, the gene coding for green fluorescent protein, you can now clone it under a constitutive promoter and when you now make a transgenic mouse out of that, if you now shine a UV light on that, you can see the entire embryo or the entire mouse fluoresces green. <coughs> so, this became a very, very powerful tool to ask a number of questions in animal systems. <coughs> Similarly. <coughs> I think I gave many examples while we studied about homeotic genes and how gene expression plays an important role in development about how homeotic genes play a very important role and we discussed a number of examples wherein when you express <coughs> homeotic genes in certain regions, it can create havoc. When you mis express or over express, it can have a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, developmental abnormalities. Here for example, as example, homeotic transformation or transformation of a cervical vertebrae in a Hox A4 mutant mice. So, using this kind of by expressing a particular Hox gene in mouse, they got a particular phenotype and this led to the understanding, this led to the new knowledge that this particular Hox gene has a particular role in that particular uh, event. Similarly, for example, Okuba and Hogan, some some around 2004, this was a paper published, wanted to understand what is the significance of this wind signaling pathway, <coughs> okay, what is the during development. <coughs> uh, so, what they did is they made a transgenic mice in which the wind signaling pathway was constitutively activated in the lungs of a late embryo. So, wind signaling as if you remember when we discussed about some of the uh, genes important in de embryonic development, we discussed extensively about wind signaling and how if you meddle with wind signaling it can lead to colon cancer and so on and so forth. So, wind is normally expressed in the intestine. Now, these people ask the question, what happens when I express this wind signaling pathway in lungs? <coughs> so, they use the lung specific promoter and express this wind proteins, wind signaling proteins in the lungs and they found that the resulting transgenic mice, the alveoli of lungs are quite abnormal being composed of large air spaces lined with highly proliferative cuboidal epithelium. Now, cuboidal epithelium is very characteristic of the intestinal villi. So, epithelium which is normally found in intestinal villi, now you start seeing in the lungs. So, this epithelium contains cells resembling different types normally found in the intestine rather than lung. Very clearly telling that this wind signaling pathway plays a very important role in the development of the intestinal epithelium. And if you now express this wind signaling, I activate this wind signaling pathway in the lung, the lung will now start developing cells which are normally present in the intestine. So, 
you can understand the function of number of these genes by doing these kinds of a experiment, transgenic experiments. Similarly, another very interesting paper that came in sometime in 2000 by Ron Evans group at Salk Institute, humanized mouse to become a basic tool for testing drug-drug interactions. What did they do? They developed a genetically engineering mouse which contained a human gene that is involved in toxification or detoxification of certain drugs. <coughs> okay? And usually the ability when you when you want to develop a new drug, the one thing that you want to see is that how well our body detoxifies these drugs. Now, the ability of and there are proteins called cytochromes P450 which are play a very important role in detoxification of these drugs. And the way the mouse cytochrome P450 wo uh, system works is quite different from the way the human cytochrome P450 system works. So many times when we want to test the ability of our body to metabolize a drug or detoxify a drug when we have to first use animal models. Many a times the way the mouse P450 system detoxifies the drug does not exactly reflect the way the human P450 system detoxifies the drug. So, the pharmacokinetics of these drugs often varies between mouse and humans. So, what did they do? They actually expressed the human P450 in a mouse and this now demonstrated that this kind of a transgenic mice expressing human P450 exactly mimics what how the drug will be metabolized in a human system. So, very, very interesting. So, you can actually use the humanized xenobiotic response in mice expressing a nuclear reactor SXR and so on and so forth. Similarly, another very interesting uh, uh, observation again by the same group, Ron Evans group, demonstrated what is called a secret of a marathon mouse. What did they do? They developed a strain of mouse which, act, which expressed a nuclear receptor called PPR gamma in the skeletal muscle. <coughs> Okay. Now, PPR gamma is a nuclear receptor, peroxisome proliferator activated receptor and all they ask the question what happens if you constitutively activate this nuclear receptor in the skeletal muscle of the mouse. So, the generative transcription transgenic mouse in which this particular nuclear receptor is expressed constitutively in the skeletal muscle and this is what happened. The red muscle, the, this is the normal mouse, this is how the gastros, uh, gastronomous mouse, mouse uh, muscle looks like, the normal mouse, but the entire muscle turned red. So, the red muscle increased transgenic in these transgenic mice and these mice were able to exercise much better. So, if you take these mice and put it on a treadmill, they exercise non-stop. Their ability to work on the treadmill was much, much better than compared to the non-transgenic mice. Now, what does it tell you? This clearly tells you that this particular nuclear receptor plays a very, very important in this kind of an exercise induced tolerance and changes the muscle physiology and muscle structure. <coughs> so, people now ask the questions, can you now develop drugs which can constitutively activate PPR gamma delta and can you now produce better athletes who can run much better than those where the PPR gamma is not constantly activated in the skeletal muscle. So, by understanding this, by using these kinds of mice models and expressing these genes or over expressing genes in specific regions, you can try to understand what is the physiological function of these nuclear receptors and these transcription factors and so on and so forth. So, <coughs> I mean there are number of examples, again there is an example of paper published in 2002 about generation of what is called as a mighty mice, transgenic mice with a truncated form of myostatin. They had increasing muscle mass and strength and so on and so forth. So, sky was the limit following the Brinsters and parameters experiments that you can actually introduce genes from the germline of mouse. A number of research groups started looking or using this kind of a transgenic technology for either understanding how promoters and enhancers work or to understand what is the physiological function of key genes and key transcription factors and so on and so forth. So, Having explained to you how the transgenic technology became very important and I just gave a few examples, very exciting and interesting examples, but the literature has number of such examples one can go and look up. Basically tell you that the discovery of transgenic, uh, the generation of transgenic mice technology by Brinster and Palmiter opened up the floodgates for introducing genes into the germline of mice as well as other farm animals for a number of uh, uh, um, problems both for understanding basic aspects of gene function and promoter function as well as for certain very important human applications. So, let us now spend some time to understand how do you exactly produce the transgenic animals or a transgenic mouse. There are many ways of producing these transgenic mice, but what Brinster and Palmitted basically did was to use a technique called as micro injection of genes into fertilized eggs. There are other things where you can actually introduce genes into the blastocyst 
you can take embryonic stem cells from the mouse and introduce your genes into the embryonic stem cells, select those embryonic stem cells which are taken up the gene and put these ES cells back into the blastocyst. So, you can also generate transgenic measuring technology. You can also take inject a retrovirus into the uh, uh, blastocyst. So, the retrovirus goes and infects the uh, embryonic stem cells and therefore, the gene gets integrated and you can generate a uh, it can be going to germline and you can generate transgenic mice. There are other technologies like nuclear transfers, artificial chromosomes for gene transfer using even sperm as gene transfer vehicles, but we will not spend too much time on this. I am going to discuss only two of these techniques for the want of time. How micro injection this is a very popular technique, widely used technique for generating transgenic mice as well as blastocystic injection can be used for generating transgenic mice and transgenic animals. So, the first step in generation of a transgenic mice is you have to make a construct, okay. whether you want to study the function of a gene or whether you want to study the uh, uh, function of a promoter, you have to make a transgenic construct. So, typically a transgenic construct should con consist of a promoter or enhancer sequence of your interest. This can be a constitutive promoter, this can be a tissue specific promoter or this can be a developmentally regulated promoter or so on and so forth depending upon your choice. It should contain your gene of your interest, your gene can be a transcri code for a transcription factor or it can be a reporter gene and depending upon what you want to do. Whether you want to study the function of a promoter, then you put a reporter gene or if you want to express the gene of your interest, then you choose a well characterized promoter and put your gene of your interest which you want to examine. Of course, should also have the appropriate 3 prime regulatory regions so that the RNA gets properly polyalinated and so on and so forth. So, the first step in generation of a transgenic animals is to make a transgenic construct or a vector which contains your gene of interest with an appropriate promoter and 3 prime regulatory sequences. So, once you made this transgenic construct, then you have to introduce this transgene into a fertilized the nucleus of a fertilized egg. So, what you do? You do what is called as a micro injection. <coughs> so, the DNA of your interest is then introduced in the male pronucleus of a fertilized egg. So, basically what you do, you take fertilized mouse fertilized egg. <coughs> so, that once the mouse you, uh, oocyte is fertilized by the sperm, you will have both the female pronucleus as well as the male pronucleus and you hold this fertilized egg as shown in this figure with a holding pipette with a very mild uh, uh, vacuum and you can hold using a holding pipette, you hold the fertilized egg and then through a very fine injection needle, you introduce this uh, DNA of your interest into the male pronucleus of the fertilized egg. And you can see here there is a nucleus here and through this needle you can actually introduce very, very tiny amounts of your uh, gene of your interest into the uh, male pronucleus of the fertilized egg. Now, when you do this, most of the eggs do not survive because you are basically poking the into the egg and sometimes you may be damaging and so on and so forth, but about 1 to 30 percent of this injected eggs actually survive. So, this depends on how good a technician you are. Okay? So, if you can do it well, then most of the, ex the efficiency of transgenesis depend upon how well you can do this micro injection without damaging the eggs. So, once you introduce this gene into the uh, uh, eggs, you then take this injected eggs, culture them for some time and make sure that they are viable and then take these viable ones and once it go into a 2 cell or a 4 cell stage, you put them back into what is called as a foster mother. So, the first step now, if you want to now inject micro inject DNA into the eggs, first you have to generate sufficient number of eggs. Now, normal the number of eggs which are generated produced by normal mouse usually is not, not, not sufficient because as I said, many eggs get damaged during the micro injection experiment, many do not survive the procedure. So, you need to inject a large number of these eggs in order to do a transgenesis. So, that means you need to have a large number of this mouse eggs. So, you do what is called as a super ovulation. That means you make these mice lay more eggs. So, that you can by killing less number of mice, you can get more number of eggs. So, what you do is you generate what is called a super ovulated female. That means, you take a female mouse and inject them with a pregnant mare serum, pregnant horse serum which basically contains follicle stimulating hormone which stimulates the growth of ovarian follicles and then you inject human chorionic gonadotropin on day 3 which now <coughs> results in the ovulation. So, you increase the number of follicles maturation by injecting FSH and then you make the mice ovulate so that you get more number of eggs per mouse. 
and then you collect then you make this on uh, day 4 mm. so you do it on day 1 you give fsh day 3 you get hcg and you on uh, day 3 uh, you actually make them with a vasectomized uh, male <coughs> with a sorry with a fertile uh, male so that the sperm will now go and then fertilize the egg and you get a fertilized dx so then you can dissect out on day 4 and then you can collect all the fertilized eggs and then inject your dna and these micro injected eggs are then implanted either on the same day or are incubated in a co2 incubator overnight and then implanted the next day and this is the time you make sure that only those eggs which look healthy uh, which are not damaged or segregated and those are implanted into the uterus of a pseudo pregnant female the injected eggs are transferred into the oviduct of a 0.5 day post coitum pseudo pregnant female now what is a pseudo pregnant female again mm. a pseudo pregnant females are actually generated by mating a normal fertile female with a vasectomized male mm. so basically the female mice are tricked into thinking that they are pregnant so when these two mate because it is vasectomized the sperm are not delivered but the uterus now <coughs> um, um, uh, becomes ready to receive the uh, embryo uh, embryos which are now implanted by after the, the injected embryos. So, you generate what is called a pseudo pregnancy and therefore, when you implant into such pseudo pregnant females the injected uh, uh, embryos then they go and implant to the uterus and you generate offspring. So, there are three major events for generating transgenic mice one is you need to prepare a construct of your interest and then you have to inject this construct into the fertilized egg preferentially the male pro nucleus of the fertilized egg and then once you are injected you take these inject micro injected eggs and put them into the oviduct of pseudo pregnant female mice. So, that these eggs go through the oviduct into the uterus and get implanted and you will get the offspring. So, these are the three major events that you have to do for generating transgenic mice. So, this is one major method of generating transgenic mice using what is called as a micro injection technique. The other popular method of generating transgenic mice especially after the advent of embryonic stem cells is instead of doing all these things once you have embryonic stem cells in culture you directly introduce your gene of your interest in the embryonic stem cells because we know ES cells can populate they are pluripotent and they can generate all three germ layers right. Therefore, you can introduce your gene to the embryonic stem cells rather than into fertilized egg. So, we have embryonic stem cells you isolate either from the inner cell mass of a blastocyst or if you have an ES cells in culture you take this ES cells introduce your transgene into the ES cells either by what is called as an electroporation or you can use viral vectors like a lentivirus or a retrovirus and so on and so forth. And then you select the embryonic stem cells which have taken up the DNA usually the transgenic constitutive mate should also contain a gene coding for an antibiotic resistance marker. Therefore, you can actually select only those ES cells which have taken up your transgene construct and those ES cells which contain your transgene construct is now introduced back into the uh, blastocyst. No. So, in the case of ES cell, in the case of the micro injection technique, you are introducing DNA into the male pro nucleus of the fertilized egg, whereas in this case, you are first introducing your transgene into embryonic stem cells and the embryonic stem cells is then introduced into the blastocyst of the blastocyst. So, that this ES cells now mix with the endogenous ES cells and repopulate and you get a um, transgenic mouse. So, you implant the blastocyst into pseudo pregnant female. So, in the case of the micro injection you are implanting the fertilized injected fertilized DX may be day 2 uh, two cell embryos or so on and so forth whereas in the case of the embryonic stem cells you are actually implanting the embryos uh, containing the ES cells into the pseudo pregnant female. <coughs> so, the offspring generated because the embryo contains both normal ES cells as well as ES cells which have been uh, 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 which contains the transgene of interest they become chimeric. That means, they, will, they are populated by both population non transgenic as well as transgenic ES cells therefore, they become chimeras and then you breed them further <coughs> um, and then segregate them by successive breeding by gen you can generate homozygotes, heterozygotes as well as transgenic homozygotes. So, by successful breeding you can generate both homozygous uh, that is mice which are homozygous for your transgene, mouse which are heterozygous as well as the non transgenic ones. So, this is the summary of the two very popular methods of generating the transgenic mice. In one case you inject your DNA into the male pro nucleus of the fertilized egg and then you implant it into the uh, oviduct of a pseudo pregnant female and then you screen the offsprings for the presence of transgene and do your experiments. In another case 
you introduce your DNA into the embryonic stem cells, select those embryonic stem cells which are expressing your gene, introduce them into the blastocyst cavity. So, that along with the <coughs> normal ES, non transgenic ES cells, these ES cells both go and populate and you get a chimeric mouse and then by successful current uh, successive breeding, you can either get a homozygote or a heterozygote. So, as I said there are also other methodologies of generating means of electroporation. You can also introduce your genes by retroviral methods. You can either use a typical retrovirus or a lentivirus for introducing transfecting the ES cells. You can also do what is called a sperm mediated gene transfer <coughs> because sperm have the uh, ability to uh, penetrate genes, uh, penetrate into the egg and fertilize. What uh, <coughs> uh, this was the classic paper uh, which was published in Cell in the year 1989 where a group Italian group led by Levitrano et al. They actually demonstrated that instead of doing micro injection, you can actually use sperms as gene transfer vehicles. So, what they did is that if you simply incubate sperm with your DNA of your interest, some of the DNA gets into the sperm and they when you now take this sperm and then fertilize the eggs along with the sperm, the DNA also goes inside and you can generate transgenic mice. Those are very this again created a lot of excitement in the field saying that here is a very simple method of transgenic mice. But Many people could not reproduce experiments and in fact, Brinster came up with this uh, paper saying that there is no simple solution for transgenic mice. So, somehow this per mediate gene transfer did not become a very, very efficient technique of generating transgenic mice. In fact, our own group here at the Indian Institute of Science actually used this kind of a per mediate gene transfer to actually demonstrate that hamster sperm can in fact, if you now add DNA radio label DNA to hamster sperm, the DNA actually goes into the sperm, hamster sperm indicating that sperm somehow has the ability to bind to this DNA and they may probably can be used as gene transfer vehicles. But somehow the sperm mediated gene transfer did not become a very versatile technique for generating transgenic mice. So, like that you can also do what is called a nuclear transfer <coughs> like what we discussed in the previous classes. You can take a somatic cell and you can introduce your gene of your interest into the somatic cells and then replace the uh, uh, nucleus of a oocyte and put the deployed the nucleus from the somatic cell and do, do this nuclear transfer and then introduce them into uh, females, um, uh, pregnant males, mice and then generate offspring. <coughs> so, of all the methods of generating transgenic mice, the ones which became very popular are the micro injection and the use of ES cells for generating transgenic mice. These are the two most popular methods of generating transgenic mice. Now, not when when you generate transgenic mice, you do not the gene that you have introduced the gene into the germline do not get expressed all the time. There are many problems with this transgenic technology. Some of them, for example, it can be multiple insertions. You have no control over the number of copies that get integrated. Many a times the gene get inserted in multiple copies in a head to tail fashion and such in such cases you are not really mimicking the exact physiological regulation and many times you have over expression and you are making too much of protein and if that protein is a very important protein or a transcription factor it can have very deleterious effects. So, multiple insertions <coughs> leading to too much of protein can pose problems or your transgene may go and insert into an essential gene. Again, we see this was one of the problems when we discussed about gene therapy, where we use retroviral vectors. When the retroviral vector went and integrated into the genome, it inactivated, it activated an oncogene, and as a result, it led to cancer. In the same way, we the transgene goes and randomly integrates somewhere in the genome. In the process, it may go and insert into a essential gene, and therefore, it can do lethal, and you will not get an offspring. There are sim similarly the insertion of random integration can goes into many problems. It can silence a gene or it can activate a gene or it can lead to differential de regulation. Especially you want to study a promoter for example, when you introduce make a transgenic pause, the gene goes and integrates in a region in the chromosome which is quite different from the natural place where the promoter is active. Okay? For example, if it goes and integrates a heterochromatic region, the promoter may not function at all because you need to know that you need to go on and enter into the heuchromatic region. So, the context, the context in which the transgene is functioning, the transgenic promoter is functioning is not exactly the same as the native promoter. So, many a times if you want to understand this function of a promoter, it may not exactly reflect the actual promoter function in vivo because it is being expressed from a different chromosomal location. So, there are problems in this transgenic technology, but by and large I showed you many examples 
the transgenic technology has been successfully used to understand the function of a number of promoters as well as for expressing a number of genes of interest. Now, let us spend some time now to understand what are the applications of this transgenic technology. I already highlighted some of the applications and most of the basic research was actually done using mouse as a model system. Okay? The entire transgenic technology was developed for generating transgenic mice and by introducing promoters or by introducing genes of your interest, a number of interesting results have been obtained. But what happened in the years to come after the 1982 um, um, Brinson and Palmer paper, the transgenic technology was extended not only for mice, but also for other domesticated animals like cattle, goat, pig, birds and so on and so forth. So, what is the what what was the applications of using this transgenic technology in these other animals? As I mentioned, in the case of the mouse, the transgenic mice became an excellent tool for understanding gene function. And I gave you a few examples earlier how you can inter, you can study the function of novel genes by making transgenic mice. Many human diseases can be modeled by introducing the same mutation in the mouse. Okay. And intact organism provides a much more complete and physiological relevant picture of a transient function than immunotestine. testing. So, many a times when you want to understand the function of a gene or when you want to understand we study the effect of a mutation in a particular gene, many a times when you do these, do these things in cell lines, you will not actually get a the uh, same picture that happens in the normal physiological situation. So, studying these mutations in animal models on the exact tissues and tissues can give a more better reflection of what is happening in the normal physiological situation than testing them in cell lines. So, the animal transgenic animal models become an excellent system to understand mutations of certain genes and how do these mutations affect gene function in an animal context. Similarly, drug testing I already explained gave one example how using a human specific P450 and expressing a human P450 gene in a mouse P450, you can develop a better appropriate model and use it for drug testing. Mm -hmm. This is another example for uh, which again tells you how transgenic technology can be used. Polio virus receptor for example, the mice cannot be infected with the polio virus because for the virus to enter our cells, it has to bind to a specific cell surface receptor. Normal mice cannot be infected with the polio virus because they lack the cell surface molecule that in human serves as a receptor for the virus. So, the mice cannot be infected with the polio virus. So, what do you do? You generate transgenic mice expressing the human gene for the receptor that can be infected with the polio virus and when you do that, these mice can not only be infected with the polio virus, but it also develops the same kind of paralysis and all other disease symptoms that is normally seen in the humans. So, by expressing a gene coding for a polio virus receptor, you can now generate a mouse model which exactly mimics a disease that happens in the human. It can now be infected with the polio virus, it even develops the same kind of paralysis that happens in the humans. So, now we can actually study lot of things by using this kind of a disease models. This is just one example to tell you how the transgenic mice has been very useful in understanding certain biological aspects. Now, coming to farm animals. <coughs> by Instead of taking a introducing genes to the fertilized egg of mouse, you now introduce genes to the fertilized eggs of cattle or goat or sheep and generate transgenic animals, farm animals. And when you do this, if you for example introduce a gene expressing factor 8 or if you can use the gene expressing factor 9 or growth hormone, now you have a transgenic animal or a transgenic cattle or a transgenic goat that is expressing this recombinant protein. So, you do not have to express these genes in mammalian cells and culture or you do not have to express the genes in yeast or E. coli cells, you can express animals and these animals will now start in producing pro protein of your interest. So, you can actually convert animals into bioreactors whose cells have been engineered to synthesize marketable proteins. That is, you can sell these proteins and make money out of them. So, people usually use what are called as tissue specific promoters by <coughs> uh, for expressing these kinds of genes and it turns out making these kinds of recombinant proteins in these kind of farm animals is much more economical than producing these proteins in cell culture. And this, this is much more economical than in mammalian cell culture because mammalian cell culture is very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And a very popular method of making these recombinant proteins in transgenic farm animals is actually by expressing these recombinant proteins in animal milk. Now, why is that? This is because milk is a byproduct it is very easy to purify because there are very few other proteins in the milk 
there are only few proteins in the milk. So, you need to have less downstream processing, less number of protein purification steps to purify your recombinant protein. Whereas, if you express the same protein in animal systems or mammalian cells, because there are so many other proteins, the purification protocols are much more rigorous. You require lot more steps of protein purification by expressing them in mammalian cells than expressing your proteins in milk. It does not harm the transgenic animals because it is just a byproduct and it is not it is and your gene is expressed only in the mammary gland and therefore it is not going to harm the animal. The recombinant protein is authentically modified post translationally because you are expressing in the mammalian system. You can make large quantities because there are very powerful promoters which are expressed in the mammary gland. So, you can use mammary gland specific promoters and like for example, casein is one of the most abundant proteins in the present in the milk. Therefore, you can use the promoter coding for the casein promoter and put your transgene so that the report the your gene of interest can be produced in large amounts in the uh, mammary gland and it is a renewable source because the animals can be propagated and not only the animal the entire offspring of the animal will generate revenue for you. These are just some of the major proteins which are present in the milk and you can see casein certain V proteins like lactalbumin and other proteins like serum albumin, lysozyme, lactoferrin, immunoglobulins and so on and so forth. So, you can use any one of these milk uh, mammary gland specific promoters especially some of the most abundant proteins like casein uh, for expressing your transgene of your interest. So, that your protein can be produced in large amounts in the mammary gland. <coughs> so, this is just some of the examples I have listed here where you can actually use uh, where specific mammary gland specific promoters have been used for making economic, economically important proteins like for example, the whey acidic protein promoter has been used for expressing tissue plasminogen activator which dissolves in blood clots and transgenic goats have been made. Similarly, beta lactoglobulin promoter has been used for expressing alpha 1 antitrypsin which can actually be used for what is called as a pulmonary emphysema, <coughs> a disease that affects lungs. Yeah, same promoter has been used for expressing clotting factor 8, 9 and transgenic sheep have been produced. Similarly, I can read up a few more using this mammary gland specific promoters, very useful proteins like lactoferrin, urokinase, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, interleukin 2, all these genes have been expressed in a number of animals including mouse, sheep, cattle, rabbit, goats and so on and so forth. And <coughs> transgenic fish has also been generated and here is an example. <coughs> if you now express uh, growth hormone in the um, uh, salmon fish, these salmon grow much faster and this is a non-transgenic fish and this is a transgenic fish and you can see the fish grow now much faster than the 11 times faster than the normal fish. This was actually published in nature in 1994. Of course, this does not happen in all the fish species, but certain fish species can be made to grow much faster by expressing growth hormone in this transgenic fish. So, this just summarizes a number of events that have taken place once following the uh, technology of development of transgenic technology by Brinster and Palmiter. Ever since the development of the uh, transgenic mouse in the year 1982 uh, with a visible phenotype, the first transgenic farm animal, was, farm animal was produced in 1985 and ever since a very number of development have taken place. I will not go into details, but uh, this uh, transgenic technology has made a very important difference. Uh, leading to a number of very interesting events and one can go through this time chart to really see what are the landmark events that actually took place in transgenic livestock research. <coughs> Here is another example. Here is a researcher <coughs> um, who is trying to uh, again generate new kind of transgenic animals. What she found is that the triglycerides found in the milk of echidna, <coughs> a primitive monotreme differs from those found in the milk of other mammals in that they have a fatty acid distribution similar to that found in the vegetable oils. Now, the animal fat is different from the, the oils which are present in the plants right and most of the vegetarians actually use only vegetable oils, they do not use the animal fat. And what she is now is trying is that can you actually clone and characterize the substrate specificity of the echidna triglyceride biosynthetic enzymes with a view of making vegetarian milk. For example, can you now express these kinds of a genes in the animal so that you can now get milk which actually contains these uh, uh, triglycerides which are normally present in the plants and rather than the triglycerides which are normally present in the animals. Again, this I will publish some of the papers one can actually go through um, and then read up a little bit more. What these are all just examples to see what kind of genes you can express and how you can generate revenue out of very interesting ideas and making useful proteins or expressing useful genes in transgenic animals. 
<coughs> since we are talking about this course is on gene expression basics and benefits wherever possible I have been telling you what products or process that came out of these kinds of basic research. Here is another example company called GTC Biotherapeutics actually produced the first recombinant human antithrombin produced using transgenic technology. So, GTC Biotherapeutics in February 2009 announced <coughs> that the US United States Food and Drug Administration approved antithrombin for the prevention of perioperative and peripartum thrombolytic thromboembolic events in hereditary antithrombin defect, defective patients. So, here is a company called uh, GTC Biotherapeutics which actually developed the first recombinant human antithrombin. <coughs> So, in February 2009 this company announced that the US United States Food and Drug Administration actually approved what they call as ATRYN A tyrin <coughs> which is nothing but antithrombin recombinant for the production prevention of perioperative and peripartum thromboembolic events in hereditary antithrombin deficient patients. And this is the GTC's recombinant human antithrombin which has been approved for use in the United States and this is the first therapeutic product produced in transgenic animals to be approved anywhere in the world. So, thanks to the efforts of Brown, Brinster and Palmiter which started way back in 1982, today we actually have a product which have been approved for human use produced in a transgenic animal. So, many such recombinant therapeutics are likely to come out. So, transgenic farm animals are being used can be used as bioreactors for making proteins and these proteins go through clinical trials and can get approvals from regulatory agencies can actually be used in humans for uh, certain therapeutic purposes. <coughs> so, one can actually go to the website of GTC Bio to look and see what are the other products that are likely to come out of this company. In fact, the company says that they are, on, they are in the process of producing a number of useful proteins in transgenic animals for example, coagulation factors like factors ATA, factor 9 and so on and so forth in collaboration with another company called LFB Biotechnologies using the transgenic production platform. They are establishing a transgenic rabbit production system for the production of recombinant factor 7A for developing uh, for treatment of patient hemophilia. They are also trying to establish a transgenic goat production system for the production of certain monoclonal antibodies for treatment of specific cancers. So, indicating that companies have now come forward to make the use make use of this transgenic technology, transgenic farm animals are being now uh, produced which can express many therapeutic proteins and some of these proteins have either got regulatory approvals or in the process of getting regulatory approvals for use in humans. There are many other companies which are using this transgenic biotechnology for making human proteins. <coughs> there is some company called Revive Car, Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Syngen Bio Syngen International, Brissica Gen. One can actually go to the websites of this company and see what kind of exciting research is going on in these companies and how many more recombinant therapeutic proteins is likely to come out of these transgenic animals. <coughs> This is just a list to show that what all the proteins that are getting exp uh, being exp produced, produced in transgenic animals, human hemoglobin from pigs, human lactoferrin from cow's milk, alpha 1 antitrypsin being produced in sheep, human growth hormone in mouse urine using uroplakin promoters which is <coughs> human antibodies in mice, the <coughs> uh, tissue plasmogen activator, antithrombin, malaria antigens are being expressed in goats for making malaria vaccines, alpha glucosidase for diesel like palms disease and so on and so forth. So, a number of useful proteins are likely to be expressed or being expressed in these transgenic farm animals and many of them are likely to become products after getting regulatory approvals. So, I have just listed some very interesting and important publications that actually came between 1980s and the, um, the 1980s once Brinson and Palmiter discovered this transgenic technology, one can go through some of these publications to see what was the excitement that was generated in the late 90, early 1980s when these two uh, pioneers generated this transgenic technology. There is also a very nice interview with Ralph Brinster which was published in this International Journal of Development Biology and he explains how exactly he developed this transgenic technology and what all the uh, interesting excitement he went through, how he began these experiments ultimately culminating the development of this that growth hormone expressing transgenic mice. <coughs> there is another uh, interesting review called intestine in the lung as he just explained how by expressing the Wnt genes in the lung you can actually uh, uh, transform the lung cells into intestine cells. There is a nice review in general of biology. <coughs> there is again a very nice review in nature drugs discovery about using reporter mice in drug discovery and development and one can 
study this review to understand how transgenic technology being or transgenic animals are being used for testing drug testing by expressing things like p450 genes and so on and so forth so i think i'll stop here <coughs> and uh, in the next class we'll discuss about generating what is called a knockout mice so far we discussed about expressing genes over expressing genes and generating transgenic mice in the next class we'll discuss how we can knock out a gene how we can delete the function of a gene and how this technology was developed and where we are heading what is the basic as well as benefits that came out of this knockout technology thank you